I am from Donaghadee originally. I went to Belfast College of Art in the 60s and then the Royal College of Art 68-70s, so I missed the troubles. Um, and there wasn't real incentive to come back at that point. So um, I was trained in fashion and I'm not comfortable with that descriptor these days because it's very transient and um, you know 1% of what we wear ends up being recycled, 60% ends up in landfills and so um, most of my life has been on more functional clothing, clothing that has to look good and work and it's more end user driven than fashion themes. Um, so during that time uh, we've got much more um, involved with uh, sustainable challenges and that's what I'm going to look at and then look at some solutions. So um, this isn't going back to the beginning of what I was doing, but in the mid-90s, I met a designer from Finland at an event in the UK, and Finland was going into the EU at that point, and they had money for people to come and teach in English, it didn't matter what you were teaching actually, but I'd got a sort of plan for a performance sports and design program at the University of Derby, and so I went to Finland and we tested that out. They, they also funded 10 students to come. So we took six fashion, two textiles, two graphics, and worked with Finnish students. And that was the beginning of a long collaboration that has ended up with the clothing that is behind you. So I can speak about that later. Uh, the master's program in performance sportswear was unique in the world and it's only now at master's level that Sheffield Helen is starting a new program called Design for Performance Sport because most fashion people um, get a taxi if it rains. Um, you know I was you know a design student when you went to have long blonde hair and a white face and be good at false eyelashes and I was living on the edge of the beach not being very good at that but when sportswear and um, fashion began to cross over in streetwear. You know, nobody wears camel hair coat to London anymore or to a major city. They quite often wear, uh, you know, casualised clothing. Um, so it was quite good timing for me to get going on um, learning about uh, different fibres and different finishes and clothing that you had to be able to move in, so cutting for ergonomics of movement. So that's the background. Then after the master's programme had been established for about a decade, my parents got to 95 and 91 here, so I came back for a year and then was headhunted to run smart clothes and wearable technology. So that was the uh, embedding of technologies in clothing and looking at sports layering you have a close space layer you have insulated mid layer and you have waterproof outerwear and so it was putting uh, warming devices or vital signs monitoring or positioning devices um, into clothing and obviously I wasn't the electronics expert but I was able to um, this was research and I was able to tell people how to cut the movement you know because you have to be able to measure golf swing or measure something that involves you know putting your arms up in the air passion cutting books don't tell you how to do that so um, then at the end of leading from sports red design um, we put in for funding under the new dynamics of aging and by that I by then I was in my 60s and you know if you go out in the morns, you go out on the hill anywhere or you go for walks, quite often it's my age group and the industry doesn't cater for, you know, they're still trying to cater for 
catwalk fashion. So we got a joint research council funding to look at um, design for ageing well and we had a user group of older people and it was really interesting finding out what they knew and what they didn't know about um, textiles and clothing. And then it's been mentioned the Lynn Biennale, I got back to Northern Ireland and met Robert and Anthony and Robert said, what about linen? And I thought, well, the house I live in was on the site of a barber summer house, barber um, thread summer house. And by then, you know, interest was growing in sustainability and linen has got a very good story in terms of um, not needing many pesticides, not needing much irrigation. That was till climate change when there are challenges now. And um, I suppose here, quite a lot of people take linen for granted and probably associated with clothing. Uh, so I found that it could be a chair, it could be a surfboard, it could be musical instruments. So I learned um, a scoping study for in Best Northern Ireland, the Collaborative Growth Network scoping study. And I brought together composite engineers, mostly men, and textile people, mostly women. And at the core, we had um, a musical instrument designer from Newton Arts, we had a furniture designer, and we had um, Cecilia Stevens, a textile designer. So we, we ensured that those disparate communities um, were speaking in a language, lay language, that meant they could communicate with each other, sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, we then attracted Mal and Linen, and that's gone from strength to strength. You know, they've now got um, from fibre to, from field to, to fibre. So, effectively, um, you know, I've been through all these stages and um, hopefully I'll calm down. I'm lucky to be here because I've just had brain surgery, but um, <laughs> I've got to think which way to go following this. Uh, the last exhausting thing was to reissue, re edit uh, smart clothes and wearable technology. And now you wouldn't want to put wiring and batteries embedded into clothing what would you do end of life so in that um, book that's got about 20 different um, authors i've written chapters as to do with um, how we can look at more sustainable uh, biopolymers and things so um, anyway so that's me as they say so something old something new um it was to look at linen, which has got this amazing story, uh, but also to realise that 1% of the world's textiles is flax, uh, and that's primarily Northern Europe and Belarus, but in the Baltics. Um, and we've got you know, Malin linen beginning again here, but we need, um, we also need more cellulosics because cotton which is cellulosic also has got a really bad story about you know, water and pesticides needed in its cultivation. So something old is continuing to look at linen, but also to look at what's happening, other sources of um, cellulosics. And looking at, now that we've got digitalization, um, you know, from measurement of the body to putting garments together to um, embellishment, you can customise garments. So in theory, we should in future be able to um, have garments that are something that we could have helped choose the elements within that garment and just have it become an old friend and not feel that it's you know, got to be discarded. Because a lot of the clothing mind in um, you know, landfill is because people have really paid too little for it and don't consider those decisions. Because, you know, if you find a t shirt for 19 99 or even less, you think, oh, well, just have that and 
Egyptian books, you know. Uh, so we got Arts Council Northern Ireland funding for this project, Something Old, Something New, um, with myself and Sia Pramaska, who I first met in Finland in the mid 90s, as I said, with Leonardo and Erasmus money. And then, me at 75 at that point, almost 76, Sirpa at 68, we thought, we need to get some younger people involved. So we took, uh, well, we, we helped Emily Crawford at Ards and North Down make an application for a festival exchange funded by the British Council. And we merged those two projects together. So what you've got in the background are uh, the work of Ruth Morrow, who was the younger textile person, Pirio Sediki, who's done the digital prints. It's only 10 years I'm younger than us, but um, anyway, it was really much um, stronger having both those projects merged. So when Ruth came to Finland, I went at the same time. Sirpa was the host for accommodation. And then uh, when Pirio came here, she came at the time of Creative Peninsula, and Sirpa came as well, and I was the host. So it really worked, not just with the basic funding, but for all the value in kind that we put in, just for the love of it. Um, so that's the story behind what is on show here. So I think I've implied that the fashion industry is pretty, you know, bad. It's said to be the second most polluting industry after petroleum, and a lot of the fabrics are made from fossil fuels. And that is, you know, landfill. Um, and this is happening across the world. Uh, <coughs> then um, pollution from the, um, you know, the dye stuffs, the, um, well, from right from the, um, sorry, right from the um, cultivation through to the manufacture of textiles and clothing. And then um, polymers in the ocean. It's not just polyesters. There's um, textiles from years ago that have nasty pesticides or dye stuffs. And then, of course, we've got, we all sit up and take note if there's um, something awful happens, like Bangladesh, and um, what they've found is that nothing much has happened in Bangladesh in the last decade. So out of sight, out of mind. Then Greenpeace had a go at the, especially the sports industry, because if we go out into the outdoors, we don't expect to be wearing clothing that is polluting. Um, so, you know, effectively we need people just in general to understand more about what they're wearing so that they're more informed in making decisions. Um, just to quickly recap, we used to wear old clothing for sport until the space race, the uh, space age layering system, the, um, you know, the astronaut spacesuits were really where lots of those modern fibres and Teflon finishes and things came from military preparedness in the space race. And then we only had lycra from that sort of time as well, you know, might have been invented sooner, but, you know, it became more um, relevant, uh, more prevalent in the late, in the 60s. And um, it was used for uh, corsetry um, as well. So that enabled us to have things that fitted better, but also things that you could move in more easily. And we now take it for granted. Um, so, uh, really, uh, this project looks at uh, whether it's, you know, the clothing here, it's not transient fashion, it's enduring. Um, you know, we, we want it to be user-led, the garments there we don't see it as being ageist you know we think that various age groups could wear them and um, basically linen is durable and you could hang on to these things forever um, some of the other garments there are 
uh, the yellow jacket is wool and nettle, the blue jacket is wool and wax, and um, there's a darker jacket that is uh, hemp and wool. And the waistcoat there is peat, but if anybody's interested, they can ask me more later. So back to form and function. It was uh, Rab, Rab Carrington was a climber. Uh, Yvonne Schunau of Patagonia was a climber. So they looked at what was available in those days and thought, oh, I could make this better. I could put a patch on here or I could elongate that sleeve or I could do this, that and the other to it. So these were not, uh, these were people that began from end user experience. They weren't sitting in a studio drawing stuff to begin with. They were actually tinkering with clothing that they'd been wearing. And then at that point, the outdoor industry was probably cagoules in red, navy, perhaps forest green, etc. But then in 1984, Dupont, well, it was ICI Fibres and then Dupont, relaunched nylon, which had had a terrible image in the 60s, it seemed to be sweaty and nasty. They relaunched it with a crimp to give it more of a natural handle. And I was involved in making 16 development garments. So at trade fairs, you could have a swatch of the fabric and you could say, this is how it would be in this garment. And then they employed an illustrator to show, you know, to do nice promotional stuff. So in 1984 to 1988, twice a year on the night shift, because I was teaching, um, I was doing development garments for DuPont at that point and getting to know the mills, the knitters, the weavers um, in the UK and you know in Switzerland and France, Germany etc. <coughs> um, so I got quite a lot of language um, and then spoke to Sierpa when I met her at an event and she said well why don't you bring students to Finland and we did performance sportswear design projects with the six fashion, two textiles and two graphics meeting their um, Finnish counterparts. And that was early to do with recycled fleece. Wellman in the States gave us fleece to work with. This is 1984. Um, and some of those students became master students um, at the University of Derby. And they're still out with Nike and, you know, the States, Beaverton with um, Adidas and Nuremberg with Orca New Zealand, you know, so it was a unique programme and some of the people that came on the master's programme were climbers, canoeists, uh, the head of mountain equipment is um, designers from zoology. You know, I didn't get your average fashion students that would have been worried about their hair or, you know, <laughs> whatever. So um, that was really pivotal for me, getting that programme going. Uh, and that was because we had a new dean that had asked us in the mid 90s, what could we be known for in the world? And everybody kept their heads down. They didn't want to change what they were doing. And I put my hand up and said, sports run, they all glared at me. Um, but it was really, really wonderful to get that going. And I can't run through or catch, you know, I love being in the outdoors. So it wasn't all football and boxing and things. It was very much using the outdoors. And then, uh, Sierpa said we could try and get some Erasmus and Leonardo programme funding. So we wrote learning materials that were um, looking at the needs of the body. You know, why do we sweat? Why do we shiver? Um, you know, the commercial reality. Who are the leaders in certain sports brands? Who are the icons of sports practitioners? Um, you know, basically, which textiles are needed for tennis? So each student would follow one sport all the way through the programme. So they knew the market, they knew the textiles, and they would all feed back to each other in presentations. And it was really special. Um, and that's just elaborating more, you know, it needed, to, it wasn't master's level physiology. It was, um, you know, it, the umbrella was master's level, all these voices that came together. And that led to me doing my, and then Phil, Basically, that if something is going to work, now it has to look good as well. So the demands of the activity 
and an amount of the body can be addressed. But if you don't look at the culture of the end user and the aesthetic requirements of the end user, you know, what's right for one person? You know, a kid playing football is going to have totally different requirements to an older walker. You know, so really uh, uncovering what people need enables you to do things that are more fit for purpose. And that, having said that, then it becomes more sustainable. And then we finally got Joint Research Council funding to look at design for ageing well. We couldn't find the colours that the user group of older people wanted. And so we, we used neutral colours for the prototypes. But that year, the Art Door Fair had spotlights on live healthy, um, live longer, you know, so it began to be recognised that, um, you know, there was a market out there for older people. And gradually the textile oriented trade fairs, mostly in Germany, are their, their mission statement is to do with sustainability. And the uh, outdoor trade has been first really to look at reuse, repair, recycle, reimagine, all amounting to design fit for purpose. Um, and early ones were Vade in Germany set up Ecolog in the 90s and that was making the whole jacket, mid layer, base layer, trousers, everything from polyester. Given that if the thread as well was polyester, you could recycle the lot. Because polyester, you know, we're trying to avoid now, but it's pretty clean to recycle. Um, but it, they were too early. You couldn't collect the garments in for recycling. If you're doing corporate wear or, you know, garments for uh, specific companies, you can collect things in and recycle. But if you're selling to the public, um, you know, some of these garments were pretty good, they didn't wear out. So now it's recognised that you have to have a sort of cross um, brand collection system. And I don't know about you, but probably the bin sort of system in Dom Hedy is probably different to Belfast. I don't know what it's like here, but you know, we don't know what to do with our waste. And if we do, it might be different somewhere else. So. And then Patagonia said, don't buy this jacket. That was about 2011. Um, but they actually went and spoke about this at universities in the States. So they were speaking to a much bigger, wider, moneyed audience. So different people would buy a jacket. And then Houdini, more recently in Scandinavia, has you know been really, really wanting to know, is this does this product deserve to exist? Uh, and Ecolog um, in 1994, as I said, uh, before the topic of cir circular economy, um, it was just very early. And as I said, the garments were lasting too long to be collected in an organized manner. Um, so now, you know, the back building networks and working together. Collaboration is key to the way forward. You know, we can't, no brand can do it on their own. So the advent of digitalization, <coughs> the prints here are digital. Uh, Pirio's um, paintings are the background and then she superimposed the birds. So, um, you know, we used to, in the fashion trade, have to get 500 meter minimum from say Europe or sort of 2,000, 5,000 meters of us from the Far East. Whereas now a digital print can do 10 or 12 meters, you know, whatever. Um, so we can be more, um, you know, we, we can, it, it's going to cost more, but I mean, basically we, we should be paying more for clothing and keeping it longer. Um, and in the outdoor trade again, um, They've, at the major trade fairs in Germany, you can go from body scanning um, to get your body shape on something like a credit card. Um, and this 
rather nasty pair of ski pants was made in an hour on that stand. And that was a collaboration between um, computer companies, digital um, capturing of shape, uh, digital print, laser cutting, all these new processes were linked together um, to end up with the garment. There were a few women in that, on that stand that actually put the garments together at one point, but you know, it was, I think it was an hour and 10 minutes to get a ski pant. Um, and the next time I went, that was 2019, I think, they'd all gone back into their caves because this was held together by academic institutions. They brought those companies together. So this is possible. But the last time I went, which was June, this year before this, um, the printers had gone back into the print area. The body scanners had gone back into another area. So th the industry has to be committed to investing. And this sort of technology can bring clothing back to Europe, but um, they don't want to invest if they can get people to make things cheaply, out of sight, out of mind. Um, and then, this is interesting, that um, Twine company, digitally they can work out exactly what colours they need and what quantities with the yarn dyed as it comes through the machine, whether it's um, knit or weave or stitching. Uh, you don't have reels of extra thread around. You, um, you know, you've got computer program to, to do this um, jacquard or print or whatever with stitch um, patterning, uh, computerized so that there's no waste. And then of course, reuse and repair um, Patagonia, again, has always put a percentage of their profits towards the environment, but they're also promoting these stories like um, they've set up two factories in Europe to collect in garments that need repair, and that's triggered um, some of the, I think Rab and Berghaus and people that are also offering repair now. Um, but Patagonia are really tarting up garments that might have been on an expedition around the world, might have done a mountain climb. You know, so they're selling a story with the garments that have been um, reworked. So somebody can buy a garment and it's got that heritage or story with it. <coughs> and then um, they're saying 85% of clothing ends up in landfills, I think. My other statistic was from some time ago that was 60%. So what are the alternatives? Uh, we know that linen is ticking over still. It's not going to be a huge, huge market. And we'll get back to that. But to, to scale up um, fibres that can be um, more commercial, uh, you know, we've got natural fibres, quite a lot of the outdoor industries now get back to wool base layers, wool mid layers and even outer layers. But then we've got recycling, um, we've got post waste, it's gathering together old garments and shredding them and separating out the fibres and remaking new fibres. And then we've got bio, because um, basically yeah, polymers come from have been coming from fossil fuel, but you can now get them from corn, from castor oil. You know, oils that come from nature can be um, used to produce polymers. So um, you can get an equivalent of nylon from corn. No, sorry, polyester. You you can get uh, nylon type fabric from castor oil, etc. And then made to be remade when you're designing, thinking of how it's going to be separated out and processed at end of life. So 
again, Houdini in um, Scandinavia, all of those garments on the left are wool, you know, so the whole layering system can be wool. And then um, Finisterre in the UK is using wool, and that wool is from English sheep. Um, so there is a, a big problem when we're thinking, oh yeah, I'll get my polyester, my recycled polyester fleece on, or you know, that's a good thing to buy. Um, at the moment, uh, polyester bottles are very pure um, and have been sent straight, quite often they're being sent straight to the textile companies without ever having had a drink in them. So 95% um, of recycled textile feedstock comes from this source. And the EU is about to have a directive, whether or not our lot wriggle out of it or not, um, that the bottles have to go back to the drinks industry. And you see, you can get, in theory, polyester from all those islands, all those um, islands of polymers in the ocean, or from landfill. You know, we don't need more oil. There's materials around that need to be collected, but all of this costs money. But, you know, while it's out of sight, out of mind, people just keep fueling it. Can I ask a question, Jane? Um, is that okay, or do you want no, me to no, do no. it later? I don't mind. Oh. What about microplastics? Do, do they come from polyester? Yeah, I'm Are guessing, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyway, recycled polyester is a big issue that the EU Commission is looking at in Circularity Action Plan 20, 20 something rather. Um, then we've got fibres that are being retrieved from the ocean. Uh, Seco in um, Spain, I think it is, and uh, probably of the oceans that Adidas has been using. This is a fraction of what's out there. You know, there's huge islands of waste floating around in the middle of the ocean. Um, but so it's a good story, but not to get carried away by. Um, and then Sympatex is a breathable membrane. It's more known in Europe. We're still aware of Gore-Tex, which is PTFE, which is nasty. That's going to be banned. Um, but uh, they've done 30% recycled post computer textiles, but 70%, you know, recycled, non, you know, bottles that haven't been used for drink. So they've got an issue. Everybody that's using drinks bottle has got to sort themselves out before too long. And then um, the bio alternatives, uh, as I said, Evo by Fulgar, which is European, is from castor oil. Um, so that's one polymer that is, you know, got a much better story. And then um, poly, again, polyonide, which is nylon from castor oil, and German sheet wool, um, and tensile is from eucalyptus, and then waste from sugar production. You know, so there's lots of different uh, fibre sources being looked at. Um, Somewhere, did I have the sign about fibres in the ocean? Anyway, yes, you're right. Fibres in the ocean are... Um, the news has been primarily about um, polymers, but as I said, there's wool with dye stuff, there's cottons with prints, there's the pesticides that were used in the first place. So it's not just polyesters and nylon, it's... Um, Textiles in general are down there and animals are ending up with them in their system. So, Finland, that we're arriving at, uh, Alto University has set up chemistry and art as a shared department, or at least some of the chemistry and some of the art have set up chem arts. 
and they're looking at new cellulosics and they've made a fibre called ion cell and the um, when Finland had its 100th birthday the president's wife wore a dress from ion cell um, and this department is looking at a lot of stuff coming from the wood industry because people aren't using <coughs> as much paper as they used to and um, those trees are managed well and grow quickly um, have to be weeded out anyway so um, there's new fibres coming from uh, the paper industry uh, and I'm not good on the technology but anyway some of the exhibits over there the white fibre is um, that you can have a look at later is from wood pulp um, and it's called Kura which means the ice crystals on the window in winter so it's quite a nice image um, and Alta University uh, it's in Espo which is outside Helsinki um, is really innovative and they've got researchers coming from across the world and they've now set up a, an innovation centre and they're looking at uh, new waterproofing because the fluorocarbons that we have on waterproof clothing at the moment are um, going to be banned and so we need to find alternative waterproofing um, chemicals and so they're looking at natural sources and at the moment um, it hasn't been absolutely solved then uh, infinited fibre in Finland is separating, separating out um, cotton and polyester and remaking fabrics that are coming from waste and the bio innovation centre has got a large amount of funding as of this year to uh, bring in a, a professor and to bring more people into this um, area looking at uh, sustainable fibres and textiles. So this is Kura um, that we've got over here. This is primarily because Sirpa and I have known each other since the mid-90s. Her husband over those years has been feeding us while we go off on one on our uh, he's had you Fiona as well um, but his background was the um, paper industry and through him we were very lucky to get to the right person in Kura and um, we got two boxes of fibre and we looked at the newspaper in Finland which of course I couldn't read but Sirpa saw that Tampere University in equivalent of Manchester and Finland because Tampere's was two lakes one higher than the other and that drove the mills with the water going from one lake to the other um, they'd abandoned um, spinning they thought that was all you know gone because it would have been done overseas but they realized that with their own industry with infinitive fiber with another one called Spinova and Kura that there was a need for new younger people coming into the trade that knew how to produce fibres. <coughs> so they took the covers off some old machinery. This was talked about in the newspaper. Sirpa read it and she said, oh, I'll ring them. And it was two women who were charming. I think of, I'm sorry to be disparaging, but I think if it had been men in suits, we might not have managed it. <laughs> but um, so we got two boxes of fibre and with my research money managed to get six or seven hours in that um, you know in the textile lab and we got roving which is the elongated well the aligned fibers and then we got spun fiber we got needle punch that's felt like and then Sirpa went away and wove the pieces and knitted the pieces that are over there um, Kura don't know we've done that. These Finnish companies are because Finland is small and because 
scaling up textiles is hugely, hugely expensive. Uh, Spinova that I haven't talked about, but they're in New Vascular in Finland. Their funding to scale up has come from Brazil. So ridiculously, their trees are coming from Brazil because the Brazil, Brazilians have given them a lot of money. Cura is Finnish trees. Their scaling up is that the spinning should happen in um, Japan. So the Japanese don't know that we've had a box and we've done it already. Because <laughs> I'm probably what the Japanese would do be much finer, you know, sort of lingerie weight or, you know, I don't know what they're going to do. So it's at which point we tell them that we've done this. But <laughs> um, then these developments aren't that sort of commercial yet, but in Japan, um, Adidas has the uh, Stella McCartney tennis dress that's been in the Design Museum in London. Um, that's from spider silk and that's Japanese fibre. <coughs> and then the garment on the right is um, North Face Japan and that's called the Moon Parker and that's in spider silk. So people are getting there but um, it's not commercially you know available for wider audiences yet. But this is Spinova's fibre on the left. This is the uh, Finnish 100th year frock for the, is it president or prime minister? Well, anyway, the wife of the head honcho. And then uh, Spinova are working with Mary Mekko and with Bergens in uh, Sweden. Mary Mekko's outfit is 30% spin over. So some of these fibres aren't being used as solid, um, you know, bio materials yet. And then Adidas's um, story at the London Design Fair last year was uh, designers should make a design for things to be made, to be remade, you know, so that they're able to be taken apart easily for end of life. And uh, Varde that started Ecolog in the 90s, they're now revisiting mono fibres, because if you make the whole garment, all the pieces with mono, same fibre, then you can recycle the lot. So they've gone back now but in collaboration with other companies so that there's more feedstock coming to be recycled. Um, so the conclusion of this part is that sustainability can no longer be a nice add-on. Um, you know, the outdoor industry have got a sustainability charter, uh, you know, that it's an industry whereby because it needs laser cutting and bonding and welding and all of that. You can't just send those garments anywhere in the world to be made. You have to send them to recognised people with those skills. So it's more traceable than some parts of the clothing industry. Uh, but the Circular Economy Action Plan <coughs> is the um, European Green Deal. And I won't read all through that, but the, the key things are that there has to be in future the right to repair. There has to be the substantiation of green claims. You can't say this is bio, which some people at home might say it's 10% bio, call it bio. Somebody else might try and guess it to be 90%. But you know, there's no differentiation. So that needs to be more easily measurable. Um, the restriction of hazardous substances has to be addressed. And that means that anything comes in to Europe from elsewhere, it's banned if it doesn't adhere to the hazardous substances being eliminated. And then packaging waste has to be addressed. Microplastics, if you say, have got to be, um, there's got to be strategies for preventing them from, you know, like filtration and washing machines and all the rest of it. Uh, climate policy, people tend to treat climate and environment differently sometimes, but, you know, Obviously, um, that we're all aware of 
issues with climate, and that's really affecting flax, because in the States, they're beginning to look at growing flax over the winter, because, um, do you know about that? No. Yeah. Anyway, um, you know, there, is, there hasn't been enough irrigation. I mean, they don't need, irrig doesn't need irrigation as such, but it, it's just been too dry um, to, it's become a worry as to how you grow flax at the time that we used to. And then we need eco-design to be not an add-on, but to just be a way of, you know, a sort of a process that everybody's aware of. And the waste framework. So the outdoor industry is an industry that's always used high quality materials. Uh, the emerging policies coming from the EU uh, fit what the outdoor industry is trying to do and um, durability, quality, longevity um, are, you know, we're better to mend and reuse stuff than to keep buying new stuff. And um, the EU vision for 2030 is, um, you know, backing that up. So looking at flax, a new look at flax, flax can be paper, um, that's Cecilia Stevens' work from, you know, she's on the peninsula, Arts Peninsula. Um, Christine Meandersma in Holland has done a collaborative project across Northern Europe and she's used the labelling to tell the story of the collaboration. You know, it's uh, really lovely. The, the actual damask itself is a picture of the fields where the um, flax was growing. And then the different processes in the chain of flax production um, and weaving and the whole lot are stories told in the labelling. Is, that, it, sorry, Jen, is there a reason why hemp isn't used more? Um, it is going to be much more used and probably already there's probably more hemp. Um, this is a living being alley. <laughs> Um, but no, they can be used in similar ways. Um, uh, we tried metal with melon linen, and that can't be used. Yeah, it can't be treated like flax. But I'm nearly at the end, so we could have questions about that. And other people might know more than me. But um, Christine's well has done this wonderful damask tablecloth that I've got in a box under my seat, and that is, you know showing seaweed, flax, um, ab abaca. It's showing five different natural um, sustainable fibres in quite a thick damask. And the, when the plant image comes to the surface, it's in its own fibre. And then, again, this is an information graphic because the border says where the flax came from, or where the seaweed came from, or where the abaku came from, and how many grams. So it's a wonderful, beautiful thing that's also an information graphic. Then, uh, no surf, but I got my daughter um, a surfboard, which is flax, um, when I'd finished doing the um, scoping study for Invest Northern Ireland. And then, most recently, um, these panels are uh, natural fibre composite. Um, the seagull is you know, one of Pirio's prints. Uh, the print at the back is from William Clark. The fibre on the right is, I think that's hemp, uh, wool in the foreground. So those panels should be ready to show for the closing exhibition of Biennale and it's all to do with customization and collaboration I think you know Sierpa's that's my jacket that's up here with the seagull on the back mm -hmm. um, and then Sierpa's skirt but you know those same you could change a different seagull or a different bird on 
you know, you could customise garments, but they'll be expensive, but they'll last forever. And they're, you know, they're not, they're timeless in terms of shape. And those are the Finnish collaborators. So Pirio on the left collaborated with Ruth and Sirpa on the right with me. But the four of us, you know, collaborated across both the British Council and the Arts Council funding. And collaboration is key to all of this. So um, I think that's me. <laughs> um, so thank you.